Act One of A Bold Stroke for a Husband by Hannah Cowley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae Don Caesar. Read by Adrian Stevens. Don Julio. Read by Greg Giordano. Don Carlos. Read by Alan Mapstone. Don Vincentio. Read by Todd. Don Garcia. Read by Jim Locke. Don Vasquez. Read by Jim Hedrick. Gaspar. Read by Jake Malizia. Pedro. Read by Wayne Cook. Servants. Read by David Purdy. Donna Olivia. Read by Jen Broda. Donna Victoria. Read by Sonia. Donna Laura. Read by Wendy Katz Hiller. Minette. Read by Matea Bracic. Marcella. Read by Anna Maria. Sancha. Read by Larry Wilson. Ines. Read by Lynette Calkins. Stage directions read by Joanna Michael Hoyt. Scene. Spain. Remarks. Although The Bold Stroke for a Husband, by Mrs. Cowley, does not equal The Bold Stroke for a Wife, by Mrs. saint Livre, either in originality of design, wit, or humor, it has other advantages more honorable to her sex, and more conducive to the reputation of the stage. Here is contained no oblique insinuation detrimental to the cause of morality, but entertainment and instruction unite to make a pleasant exhibition at a theater, or give an hour's amusement in the closet. Plays where the scene is placed in a foreign country, particularly when that country is Spain, have a license to present certain improbabilities to the audience without incurring the danger of having them called such, and the authoress, by the skill with which she has used this dramatic permittance in making the wife of Don Carlos pass for a man, has formed a most interesting plot, and embellished it with lively, humorous, and affecting incident. Still, there is another plot, of which Olivia is the heroine, as Victoria is of the foregoing. And this more comic fable, in which the former is chiefly concerned, seems to have been the favorite story of the authoress, as from this she has taken her title. But if Olivia makes a bold stroke to obtain a husband, surely Victoria makes a still bolder to preserve one, and there is something less honorable in the enterprises of the young maiden in order to renounce her state than in those of a married woman to avert the dangers that are impending over hers. Whichever of those females becomes the most admired object with the reader, he will not be insensible to the trials of the other, or to the various interests of the whole dramatis personae, to whom the writer has artfully given a kind of united influence. And upon a happy combination it is that, sometimes, the success of a drama more depends than upon the most powerful support of any particularly prominent, yet insulated, character. The part of Don Vincentio was certainly meant as a moral satire upon the extravagant love, or the foolish affectation of pretending to love to extravagance, music. This satire was aimed at so many that the shaft struck none. The charm of music still prevails in England, and the folly of affected admirers. Vincentio talks music, and Don Julio speaks poetry. Such, at least, is his fond description of his mistress Olivia in that excellent scene in the third act, where she first takes off her veil, and fascinates him at once by the force of her beauty. In the delineation of this lady, it is implied that she is no termagant, although she so frequently counterfeits the character. This insinuation the reader, if he pleases, may trust. But the man who would venture to marry a good impostor of this kind could not excite much pity if his helpmate was often induced to act the part which she had heretofore, with so much spirit, assumed. The impropriety of making fraud and imposition necessary evils to counteract tyranny and injustice is the fault of all Spanish dramas, and perhaps the only one which attaches to the present comedy. A Bold Stroke for a Husband Act One, Scene One, A Street in Madrid Enter Sancho from a house, right door. She advances, then runs back, and beckons to Pedro within. Hust! Pedro! Pedro! Enter Pedro, right door. There he is. D does see him? Just turning by St. Anthony in the corner. 
now do you tell him that your mistress is not at home and if his jealous donship should insist on searching the house as he did yesterday say that somebody is ill the black has got a fever or that uh, fo fo get you in don't i know that the duty of a lackey in madrid is to lie with a good grace i have been studying it now for a whole week and i'll defy don or a devil to surprise me into a truth get you in i say here he comes exit sancho right door and flat enter carlos left pedro struts up to him dona laura is not at home sir not at home come sir what have you received for telling that lie 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 signor it must be a lie by your promptness in delivering it what a fool does your mistress trust a clever rascal would have waited my approach and delivering the message with easy coolness deceived me thou hast been on the watch and runnest towards me with a face of stupid importance bawling that she may hear through the lattice how well thou obeyest her donna laura is not at home sir here to the lattice ha by a lady she must have long ears to reach from the grotto in the garden to the street ha seizes him now sir your ears shall be longer if you do not tell me who is with her in the grotto in the grotto sir uh, did i say anything about the grotto i i only meant that fool dost thou trifle with me who is with her pinching his ear oh why nobody sir only the pretty young gentleman's valet uh, waiting for an answer to a letter he brought there i have saved my ears at the expense of my place i've worn this fine coat but a week and i shall be sent back to segovia for not being able to lie though i've been learning the art six days and nights well come this way if thou wilt promise to be faithful to me i will not betray thee nor at present enter the house oh sir blessings on you how often does the pretty young gentleman visit her every day sir if he misses madam stark wild where does he live truly i know not sir how menacing by the honesty of my mother i cannot tell sir she calls him florio that's his christian name his heathen name i never heard you must acquaint me when they are next together lord sir if there should be any blood spilt promise or i'll lead thee by the ears to the grotto i promise i promise there take that gives money and if thou art faithful i'll treble it now go in and be a good lad and do you hear you may tell lies to anybody else but remember you must always speak truth to me i will sir i will exit looking at the money right door and flat tis well my passion is extinguished for i can now act with coolness i'll wait patiently for the hour of their security and take them in the softest moments of their love but if ever i trust a woman more may every enter two women veiled followed by julio right fie ladies keep your curtains drawn so late the sun is up tis time to look abroad tries to remove the veils nay if you are determined on night and silence i take my leave a woman without prattle is like burgundy without spirit bright eyes to touch me must belong to sweet tongues going right ladies exit left 
sure tis julio hey julio returning don carlos yes by all the sober gods of matrimony why what business good man gravity canst thou have in madrid i understand you are married quietly settled in your own pastures father of a family and the instructive companion of country vine dressers <laughs> tis false by heaven i have forsworn the country left my family and run away from my wife really then matrimony has not totally destroyed thy free will tis with difficulty i have preserved it though for women thou knowest are the most unreasonable beings as soon as i had exhausted my stock of love tales which with management lasted beyond the honeymoon madam grew sullen i found my home dull and amused myself with the pretty peasants of the neighbourhood worse and worse we had nothing now but faintings tears and hysterics for twenty-four honeymoons more so one morning i gave her in her sleep a farewell kiss to comfort her when she should awake and posted to madrid where if it was not for the remembrance of the clog at my heel i should bound over the regions of pleasure with more spirit than a young arabian on his mountains do you find this clog no hindrance in affairs of gallantry not much in that house there but damn her she's perfidious in that house is a woman of beauty with pretensions to character and fortune who devoted herself to my passion if she's perfidious give her to the winds ah but there is a rub julio i have been a fool a woman's fool in a state of intoxication she wheedled me or rather cheated me out of a settlement oh is that oh but you know not its nature a settlement of lands that both honour and gratitude ought to have preserved sacred from such base alienation in short if i cannot recover them i am a ruined man nay this seems a worse clog than t'other poor carlos so be wived and be prithee have compassion and her servant right with a letter to julio he reads it and then nods to the servant who exits right an appointment i'll be sworn by that air of mystery and satisfaction come be friendly and communicate julio putting up the letter you are married carlos that's all i have to say you are married fool that's passed long ago and ought to be forgotten but if a man does a foolish thing once he'll hear of it all his life ay the time has been when thou mightest have been entrusted with such a dear secret when i might have opened the billet and feasted thee with the sweet meandering strokes at the bottom which form her name when what tis from a woman then it is handsome hmm not absolutely handsome but she'll pass with one who has not had his taste spoiled by matrimony malicious dog is she young under twenty fair complexion azure eyes red lips teeth of pearl polished neck fine turned shape graceful hold julio if thou lovest me is it possible she can be so bewitching a creature tis possible though to deal plainly i never saw her 
but i love my own pleasure so well that i could fancy all that and ten times more what star does she inhabit faith i know not my orders are to be in waiting at seven at the prado prado hey gad can't you take me with you for though i have forsworn the sex myself and have done with them for ever yet i may be of use to you you know faith i can't see that however as you are a poor woe-begone married mortal i'll have compassion and suffer thee to come then i am a man again wife avaunt mistress farewell at seven you say exactly i'll meet thee at philippi exeunt julio left carlos right scene two a spacious garden belonging to don caesar enter minette and inice right second door entrance there that will do my lady sent me to make her up a nosegay these orange flowers are delicious and this rose how sweet Puh. what signifies wearing sweets in her bosom unless they would sweeten her manners tis amazing you can be so much at your ease one might think your lady's tongue was a lute and her morning scold an agreeable serenade so they are custom you know i've been used to her music now these two years and i don't believe i could relish my breakfast without it i would rather never break my fast than do it on such terms what a difference between your mistress and mine donna victoria is as much too gentle as her cousin is too harsh ay and you should see what she gets by it had she been more spirited perhaps her husband would not have forsaken her men enlisted under the matrimonial banner like those under the king's would be often tempted to run away from their colours if fear did not keep them in dread of desertion if making a husband afraid is the way to keep him faithful i believe your lady will be the happiest wife in spain <laughs> how people may be deceived nay how people are deceived but time will discover all things what what is there a secret in the business minette if there is hang time let's have it directly now if i dared but tell ye lad lad how i can surprise ye going inis stopping her don't go i must go i'm on the very brink of betraying my mistress i must leave you mercy upon me it rises like new bread i hope it will choke ye if you stir till i know all will you never breathe a syllable never will you strive to forget it the moment you have heard it i'll swear to myself forty times a day to forget it are you sure you will not let me stir from this pot till you know the whole not as far as a thrush hops so now then in one word here it goes though everybody supposes my lady an errant scold she's no more a looking out don caesar without left out a pont eh? oh saint jerome here is her father and his privy counsellor gasper i can never communicate a secret in quiet well come to my chamber for now my hand's in you shall have the whole i would not keep it another day to be confidant to an infanta exeunt right enter don caesar and gasper left take comfort sir take comfort take it why where the devil shall i find it you may say take physic sir or take poison sir they are to be had but what signifies bidding me take comfort when i can neither buy it beg it nor steal it but patience will bring it sir tis false sirrah 
patience is a cheat, and the man that ranked her with the cardinal virtues was a fool. I have had patience at bed and board these three long years, but the comfort she promised has never called in with a civil how dear. Ay, sir, but you know the poets say that the twin sister and companion of comfort is good humour. Now, if you would but drop that agreeable acidity which is so conspicuous. Then let my daughter drop her perverse humour. Tis a more certain bar to marriage than ugliness or folly and will send me to my grave at last without male heirs <laughs> how many have laid siege to her but that humour of hers like the works of gibraltar no spaniard can find pregnable Ay, well, Troy held out but ten years. Let her once tell over her beads, unmarried at five and twenty, and my life upon it, she ends the rosary with a hearty prayer for a good husband. What? Do you expect me to wait till the horrors of old maidenism frighten her into civility? No, no. I'll shut her up in a convent, marry myself, and have heirs in spite of her. There's my neighbour, Don Vasquez's daughter, but she is but nineteen. The very step I was going to recommend, sir. You are but a young gentleman of sixty-three, I take it, and a husband of sixty-three, whom marries a wife of nineteen, will never want heirs, take my word for it. What? Do you joke, sirrah? Oh, no, sir, not if you are serious. I think it would be one of the pleasantest things in the world. Madam would throw a new life into the family, and when you are above stairs in the gout, sir, the music of her concerts and the spirit of her conversaziones would reach your sick-bed and be a thousand times more comforting than flannels and panada come come i understand ye but this daughter of mine i shall give her but two chances more don garcia and don vincentio will both be here to-day and if she plays over the old game, I'll marry tomorrow morning, if I hang myself the next. You decide right, signor. At sixty-three the marriage noose and the hempen noose should always go together. Why, you dog, you! Do you suppose? There's Don Garcia. There he is coming through the portico. Run to my daughter and bid her remember what I have said to her. Exit Gasper, right. She has had her lesson, but another memento mayn't be amiss. A young slut, pretty and witty and rich, a match for a prince, and yet... But, hist, not a word to my young man. If I can but keep him in ignorance till he is married, he must make the best of his bargain afterwards, as other honest men have done before him. Enter Garcia, left. Welcome, Don Garcia. Why, you are rather before your time. Gallantry forbid that I should not. When a fair lady is concerned, should Donna Olivia welcome me as frankly as you do, I shall think I have been tardy. When you made your overtures, senor, I understood it was from inclination to be allied to my family, not from a particular passion to my daughter. Have you ever seen her? 
but once that transiently yet sufficient to convince me that she is charming why yes though i say it there are few prettier women in madrid and she has got enemies amongst her own sex accordingly they pretend to say that i say sir they have reported that she is not blessed with a kind of docility and gentleness that a uh, uh, now though she may not be so very placid and insipid as some young women yet upon the whole oh fie sir not a word a beauty cannot be ill-tempered gratified vanity keeps her in good humour with herself and everybody about her yes as you say vanity is a prodigious sweetener and olivia considering how much she has been humoured is as gentle and pliant as and her minette right oh sir shield me from our mysteries she is in one of her old tempers the whole house is in an uproar i cannot support it hush no sir i can't hush a saint could not bear it i'm tired of her tyranny and must quit her service then quit it in a moment go to my steward and receive your wages go be gone tis a cousin of my daughter's she is speaking of a cousin sir no tis doña olivia your daughter my mistress to garcia oh sir you seem to be a sweet tender-hearted young gentleman twould move you to pity if i'll move you hussy to some purpose if you don't move off i'm really confounded can the charming olivia spite sir mere malice my daughter has refused her some cast gown or some olivia without right where is she where is minette oh tis all over the tempest is coming and her olivia right oh you vile creature to speak to me to answer me am i made to be answered daughter daughter because i threw my work-bag at her she had the insolence to complain and on my repeating it she said she would not bear it servants choose what they shall bear when you are married ma'am i hope your husband will bear your humour less patiently than i have done my husband dost thou think my husband shall contradict my will oh i long to set a pattern to those milky wives whose mean compliances degrade the sex garcia aside opportune the only husband on record who knew how to treat a wife was socrates and though his lady was a grecian i have some reason to believe her descendants matched into our family and never shall my tame submission disgrace my ancestry heavens why have you never curbed this intemperate spirit don cesar olivia starting curbed sir talk thus to your groom curbs and bridles for a woman's tongue not for yours lady truly tis too late but had the torrent not so overbearing been taken at its spring it might have been stemmed and turned in gentle streamlets at the master's pleasure a mistake friend my spirit at its spring was too powerful for any master indeed perhaps you may meet a petruchio gentle catherine yet but no gentle catherine will he find me believe it catherine why she had not the spirit of a roasted chestnut a few big words an empty oath and a scanty dinner made her as submissive as a spaniel my fire will not be so soon extinguished it shall resist big words oaths and starving i believe you so indeed help the poor gentleman i say to whose fate you fall returns up don cesar adieu my 
commiseration for your fate subdues the resentment i should otherwise feel at your endeavouring to deceive me into such a marriage crosses left marriage oh mercy apart to caesar is this don garcia yes termagant oh what a misfortune why did you not tell me it was the gentleman you designed to marry me to oh sir all that has passed was in sport a contrivance between my maid and me i have no spirit at all i am as patient as poverty this mask fits too ill on your features fair lady i have seen you without disguise and rejoice in your ignorance of my name since but for that my peaceful home might have become the seat of perpetual discord ay sir you would never have known what a quiet hour olivia strikes her impertinence indeed sir i can be as gentle and forbearing as a pet lamb i cannot doubt it madam the proofs of your placidity are very striking but adieu though i shall pray for your conversion rather than have the honour of it i turn dominican and condemn myself to perpetual celibacy exit left now hussy now hussy what do you expect dear me how can you be so unreasonable did ever daughter do more to oblige a father i absolutely begged the man to have me yes vixen after you had made him detest ye what i suppose he did not hit your fancy madam though there is not in all spain a man of prettier conversation yes he has a very pretty kind of conversation tis like a parenthesis like a parenthesis yes it might be all left out and never missed however i thought him a modest kind of a well-meaning young man and that he would make a pretty sort of husband for notwithstanding his blundering had i been his wife in three months he should have been as humble and complacent as ay there it is there it is that spirit of yours hussy you can neither conquer nor conceal but i'll find a way to tame it i'll warrant me exit right olivia and minette follow him with their eyes and then burst into a laugh <laughs> well madam i give you joy had other ladies as much success in getting lovers as you have in getting rid of yours what contented faces we should see but to what purpose do i get rid of them whilst they rise in succession like monthly pinks was there ever anything so provoking after some quiet and believing the men had ceased to trouble themselves about me no less than two proposals have been made to my inexorable father this very day what will become of me what should become of you you choose one from the pair i hope believe me madam the only way to get rid of the impertinence of lovers is to take one and make him a scarecrow to the rest oh but i cannot invention assists me this one day upon my word madam invention owes you nothing and i am afraid you can draw on that bank no longer you must trust to your established character of vixen but that won't frighten them all you know though it did its business with sober don garcia the brave general antonio would have made a property of me in spite of everything had i not luckily discovered his antipathy to cats and so scared the hero by pretending an immoderate passion for young kittens yes but you were still harder pushed by the castilian count and his engraved genealogy from noah oh he would have kept his post as immovably as the griffins at his gate had i not seriously imparted to him that my mother's great uncle sold oranges in aragon and pray madam if i may be so bold who is the next gentleman oh don vincentio who distracts everybody with his skill in music he ought to be married to a vile da gamba i bless my stars 
I have never yet had a miser in my list. On such a character, all art would be lost, and nothing but an earthquake to swallow up my estate could save me. Well, if someone did but know, how happy would someone be that for his sake... Now don't be impertinent, Minette. You have several times attempted to slide yourself into a secret, which I am resolved to keep to myself. Continue faithful and suppress your curiosity. Exit, right. Suppress my curiosity, madam? Why, I am a chambermaid, and a sorry one too, it should seem, to have been in your confidence two years and never have got the master secret yet. I never was six weeks in a family before, but I knew every secret they had in it for three generations. Aye, and I'll know this too, or I'll blow up all her plans and declare to the world that she is no more a vixen than other fine ladies. They have most of them a touch on Exit, right. End of Act One. Act Two of A Bold Stroke for a Husband by Henna Cowley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One An Apartment at Dona Laura's. Enter Laura, followed by Carlos, left. Nay, madam, you may as well stop here, for I'll follow you through every apartment, but I will be heard. Seizing her hand. This insolence is not to be endured, within my own walls, to be thus. The time has been when within your walls I might be master. Yes, you were then master of my heart. That gave you a right which... You have now transferred to another, flinging away her hand. Well, sir. Well, sir. Unblushing acknowledgement. False fickle woman. Because I have luckily got the start of you. In a few weeks I should have been the accuser, and you the false and fickle. And to secure yourself from that disgrace, you prudently looked out in time for another lover. I can pardon your sneer, because you are mortified. Mortified? Yes, mortified to the soul, Carlos. Carlos, stamping. Madam, madam... This rage would have been all cool insolence had I waited for your change. Scarcely would you have deigned to form a phrase of pity for me. Perhaps have bid me forget a man no longer worthy my attachment, and recommend me to heart's horn and my women. Has any hour since I have first known you given you cause for such unjust— Yes. Every hour. Now, Carlos, I bring thee to the test. You saw, you liked, you loved me. Was there no fond trusting woman whom you deserted to indulge the transient passion? Yes, one blessed with beauty, gentleness, and youth. One who more than her own being loved thee, who made thee rich, and whom thou madest thy wife. My wife? Here's a turn. So, to revenge the quarrels of my wife... No, do not mistake me. What I have done was merely to indulge myself without more regard to your feelings than you had to hers. And you dare avow to my face that you have a passion for another? I do. And, for I am above disguise... I confess, so tender is my love for Florio, it has scarcely left a trace of that I once avowed for Carlos. Well, madam, if I hear this without some sudden vengeance on your tongue which speaks it, thank the annihilation of that passion whose remembrance is as dead in my bosom as in yours. Let us, however, part friends, 
and with a mutual acquittal of every obligation so give up the settlement of that estate which left me almost a beggar give it up <laughs> no carlos you consigned me that estate as a proof of love do not imagine then i'll give up the only part of our connection of which i am not ashamed base woman you know it was not a voluntary gift after having in vain practised on my fondness whilst in a state of intoxication you prevailed on me to sign the deed which you had artfully prepared for the purpose therefore you must restore it never never ruin is in the word call it back madam or i'll be revenged on thee in thy heart's dearest object thy minion florio he shall not riot on my fortune <laughs> florio is safe your lands are sold and in another country we shall enjoy the blessings of thy fond passion whilst that passion is indulging itself in hatred and execrations. Exit right. My vengeance shall first fall on her. Following. No, he shall be the first victim, or twill be incomplete. Reduced to poverty, I cannot live. Oh, folly! where are now all the gilded prospects of my youth had i but tis too late to look back remorse attends the past and ruin ruin waits me in the future exit left scene two don caesar's victoria enters left perusing a letter enter olivia right olivia speaks as entering if my father should inquire for me, tell him I'm in Donna Victoria's apartment. Smiling, I protest. My dear gloomy cousin, where have you purchased that sunshiny look? It is but April sunshine, I fear, but who could resist such a temptation to smile? A letter from Donna Laura, my husband's mistress, styling me her dearest Florio, her life, her soul and complaining of a twelve hours absence as the bitterest misfortune <laughs> most doughty dawn pray let us see you in your feather and doublet as a cavallero it seems you are formidable so suddenly to rob your husband of his charmer's heart you must have used some witchery yes powerful witchery the knowledge of my sex oh did the men but know us as well as we do ourselves but thank fate they do not. It would be dangerous. What? I suppose you praised her understanding, was captivated by her wit, and absolutely struck dumb by the amazing beauties of her mind. Oh, no! That's the mode prescribed by the essayists on the female heart. <laughs> not a woman breathing from fifteen to fifty, but would rather have a compliment to the tip of her ear or the turn of her ankle than a volume in praise of her intellects so flattery then is your boasted pill no that's only the occasional gilding but tis in vain to attempt a description of what changed its nature with every moment i was now attentive now gay then tender then careless i strove rather to convince her that i was charming than that i myself was charmed and when I saw love's arrow quivering in her heart, instead of falling at her feet, sung a triumphant air and remembered a sudden engagement. Olivia, archly. Would you have done so had you been a man? Assuredly, knowing what I now do as a woman. But can all this be worth while, merely to rival a fickle husband with one woman, while he is setting his feather, perhaps, at half a score others? To rival him was not my first motive. The Portuguese robbed me of his heart. I concluded she had fascinations which nature had denied to me. It was impossible to visit her as a woman. I therefore assumed the cavalier to study her, 
that i might if possible be to my carlos all he found in her pretty humble creature in this adventure i learned more than i expected my how cruel my husband has given this woman an estate almost all that his dissipations had left us indeed to make him more culpable it was my estate it was that fortune which my lavish love had made his without securing it to my children how could you be so improvident alas i trusted him with my heart with my happiness without restriction should i have shown a greater solicitude for anything than for these the event proves that you should but how can you be thus passive in your sorrow since i had assumed the man i'd make him feel a man's resentment for such injuries oh olivia what resentment can i show to him i have vowed to honour and whom both my duty and my heart compel me yet to love why really now i think positively there's no thinking about it tis among the arcana of the married life i suppose you who know me can judge how i suffered in prosecuting my plan i have thrown off the delicacy of sex i have worn the mask of love to the destroyer of my peace but the object is too great to be abandoned nothing less than to save my husband from ruin and to restore him again a lover to my faithful bosom well i confess victoria i hardly know whether most to blame or praise you but with the rest of the world i suppose your success will determine me and her gasper left to olivia pray madam are your wedding shoes ready olivia apart to victoria insolence i can scarcely ever keep up the vixen to this fellow you'll want them ma'am to-morrow morning that's all so i came to prepare ye i want wedding shoes to-morrow if you are kept on water gruel till i marry that plump face of yours will be chap fallen i believe yes truly i believe so too lack a day did you suppose i came to bring you news of your own wedding no such glad tidings for you lady believe me you married i am sure the man who ties himself to you ought to be half a salamander and able to live in fire what marriage then is it you do me the honour to inform me of why your father's marriage you will have a mother-in-law to-morrow and having like a dutiful daughter danced at the wedding be immured in a convent for life immured in a convent then i'll raise sedition in the sisterhood dispose the abbess and turn the confessor's chair to a go-cart so the threat of the mother-in-law which i thought would be worse than that of the abbess does not frighten ye no because my father dares not give me one marry without my consent no no he'll never think of it depend on it however lest the fit should grow strong upon him i'll go and administer my volatiles to keep it under exit left administer them cautiously then too strong a dose of your volatiles would make the fit stubborn who'd think that pretty arch look belonged to a termagant what a pity twould be worth a thousand ducats to cure her has innes told you i wanted to converse with you in private gaspar oh yes madam i took particular notice that it was to be in private sure says i mrs innes madam victoria has not taken a fancy to me and is going to break her mind a whimsical <laughs> suppose i should gaspar why then madam i should say fortune had used you devilish scurvily to give you a grey beard in a livery i know well enough that some young ladies have given themselves to grey beards in a gilded coach and others have run away with a handsome youth in worsted lace they each had their apology but if you run away with me pardon me madam i could not stand the ridicule oh very well but if you refuse to run away with me 
Will you do me another favour? Anything you'll order, madam, except dancing a fandango. You have seen my rich old uncle in the country. What? Don Sancho? Who, with two-thirds of a century in his face, affects the misdemeanours of youth? hides his baldness with amber locks and complains of the toothache to make you believe that the two rows of ivory he carries in his head grew there oh you know him i find could you assume his character for an hour and make love for him you know it must be in the style of king rodrigo the first hang it i am rather too near his own age to appear an old man with effect, one should not be above twenty. Tis always so on the stage. Fo, so, you might pass for Juan's grandson. Nay, if your ladyship condescends to flatter me, you have me. Then follow me, for Don Caesar I hear is approaching. In the garden I'll make you acquainted with my plan, and impress on your mind every trait of my uncle's character. If you can hit him off, the arts of Laura shall be foiled, and Carlos be again victorious. Exeunt, right. Enter Don Caesar, followed by Olivia, left. No, no, tis too late, no coaxings. I am resolved, I say. But it is not too late, and you shan't be resolved, I say. Indeed, now, I'll be upon my guard with the next dawn. What's his name? Not a trace of Xantippe left. I'll study to be charming. Nay, you need not study it. You are always charming enough, if you would but hold your tongue. Do you think so? Then to the next lover I won't open my lips. I'll answer everything he says with a smile. And if he asks me to have him, drop to a curtsy of thankfulness. Pshaw! That's too much t'other way. You are always either above the mark or below it. You must talk, but talk with good humour. Can't you look gently and prettily now, as I do, and say yes, sir, and no, sir, and tis very fine weather, sir, and pray, sir, were you at the ball last night, and I caught a sad cold the other evening, and bless me, I hear Lucinda has run away with her footman, and Don Philip has married his housemaid. That's the way agreeable ladies talk. You never hear anything else. Very true. And you shall see me as agreeable as the best of them. If you won't give me a mother-in-law to snub me and set me to tasks and to take up all the fine apartments and send up poor little Livy to lodge next to the stars. Ah, if thou wert but always thus soft and good-humoured, no mother-in-law in Spain, though she brought the Castiles for her portion, should have power to snub thee. But, Livy, the trial's at hand, for at this moment do I expect Don Vincentio to visit you. He is but just returned from England, and probably has yet heard only of your beauty and fortune. I hope it is not from you he will learn the other part of your character. This moment expect him. Two new lovers in a day? Beginning already, as I hope to live. I, I see tis in vain. I'll send him an excuse and marry Marcella before night. 
Oh, no. Upon my obedience, I promise to be just the soft, civil creature you have described. Enter a servant, left. Don Vincenzo is below, sir. Exit, left. I'll wait upon him. Well, go and collect all your smiles and your simpers. And remember all I have said to you. Be gentle and talk pretty little small talk, do you hear? And if you please him, you shall have the portion of a Dutch burgomaster's daughter and the pin money of a princess, you jade, you. I think at last I have done it. The fear of this mother-in-law will keep down the fiend in her, if anything can. Exit left. Ha, my poor father. Your anxieties will never end till you bring Don Julio. But what shall I do with this Vincentio? I fear he is so perfectly harmonized that to put him in an ill temper will be impractical. I must try, however. If tis possible to find a discord in him, I'll touch the string. Exit right. Scene three, another apartment. Enter Caesar and Vincentio, left. Presto, presto, signor. Where is the Olivia? Not a moment to spare. I left off in all the fury of composition. Minims and crotchets have been battling it through my head the whole day, and trying a semi brief in G sharp has made me as flat as double F. Sharp and flat. Trying a semi brief Oh, gad, sir, I had like not to have understood you. But a semi-brief is something of a dummy culverin, I take it, and you have been practising the art military. Art military? What, sir, are you unacquainted with music? Music? Oh, I ask pardon. Then you are fond of music. Aside. Where of discords? Fond of it? Devoted to it. I composed a thing today in all the gusto of Sacchini and the sweetness of Gluck. But this recreant finger fails me in composing a passage in E octave. If it does not gain more elastic vigor in a week, I shall be tempted to have it amputated and supply the shake with a spring. Mercy! Amputate a finger! to supply a shake. Oh, that's a trifle in the road to reputation. To be talked of is a summum bona of this life. A young man of rank should not glide through the world without a distinguished rage, or, as they call it in England, a hobby horse. A hobby horse? Yes, that is, every man of figure determines on setting out in life in that land of liberty in what line to ruin himself, and that choice is called his hobby-horse. One makes the turf his scene of action, another drives about tall phantoms to peep into their neighbor's garret windows, and a third rides his hobby-horse in Parliament, where it jerks him sometimes on one side and sometimes on the other, sometimes in and sometimes out, till at length he is jerked out of his honesty and his constituents out of their freedom. Aye, well, tis a wonder that with such sort of hobby horses as these they should still outride all the world to the goal of glory. Now this is all cantabile. Nothing to do with the subject of the piece, which is Donna Olivia. Pray, give me the keynote to her heart. Upon my word, signor, to speak in your own phrase, I believe that note has never yet been sounded. Ah, here she comes. Look at her. Isn't she a fine girl? Touching, musical, hobby sworn. Her very air is harmonious. Caesar, aside. I wish thou mayst find her tongue so. 
and her Olivia curtsies profoundly to each. Daughter, receive Don Vincentio. His rank, fortune, and merit entitle him to the heiress of a grandee. But he is contented to become my son-in-law, if you can please him. Crosses right. Olivia curtsies again. Please me. She entrances me. Her presence thrills me like a cadenza of Pacioratis, and every nerve vibrates to the music of her looks. Ah, oh, her step on Dante gently moves, pianos glance from either eye. Oh, how legato is the heart that charm so forte can defy. <sighs> Donna Olivia, will you be contented to receive me as a lover? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Bewitching timidity? Yes, sir. She's remarkably timid. Aside. She's in the right queue, I see. Tis clear you have never travelled. I shall be delighted to show you England. You will there see how entirely timidity is banished the sex. You must affect a marked character and maintain it at all hazards. Tis a very fine day, sir. Madam. I caught a sad cold the other evening. Pray, was you at the ball last night? What ball, fair lady? Bless me. They say Lucinda has run away with her footman, and Don Philip has married his housemaid. Apart to Don Caesar. Now am I not very agreeable? Oh, such perverse obedience. Really, madam, I have not the honor to know Don Philip and Lucinda, nor am I happy enough entirely to comprehend you. No, I only meant to be agreeable. But perhaps you have no taste for pretty little small talk. Pretty little small talk? A marked character you admire. So do I. I dote on it. I would not resemble the rest of the world in anything. My taste to the fiftieth part of a crotchet. We shall agree admirably when we are married. And that will be unlike the rest of the world, and therefore charming. Caesar aside. It will do. I have hit her humour at last. Why didn't this young dog offer himself before? I believe I have the honour to carry my taste that way, farther than you, Don Vincentio. Pray now, what is your usual style in living? My winters I spend in Madrid, as other people do. My summers I draw through at my castle. As other people do? And yet you pretend to taste and singularity. <laughs> Good Don Vincentio, never talk of a marked character again. Go into the country in July to smell roses and woodbines when everybody regales on their fragrance. Now I would rusticate only in winter, and my bleak castle should be decorated with verdure and flowers amidst the soft zephyrs of December. Caesar aside. Oh, she'll go too far. On the leafless trees I would hang green branches, the labor of silkworms, and therefore natural, whilst my rose shrubs and myrtles should be scented by the first perfumers in Italy. Unnatural indeed, but therefore singular and striking. Oh, charming. You beat me where I thought myself the strongest. Would they but establish newspapers here to paragraph our singularities, we should be the most envied couple in Spain. Caesar aside. By St. Antony, he is as mad as she is. What say you, Don Caesar? Olivia and her winter garden, and I and my music. Music, did you say? Music. I am passionately fond of that. Caesar aside. She has saved my life. I thought she was going to knock down his hobby horse. You enchant me. 
I have the finest band in Madrid. My first violin draws a longer bow than Gardini. My clarinets, my viola de gamba. Oh, you shall have such concerts. Concerts? Pardon me there. My passion is a single instrument. That's carrying singularity very far indeed. I love a crash. So does everybody of taste. But my taste isn't like everybody's. My nerves are so particularly fine that more than one instrument overpowers them. Pray, tell me the name of that one. I am sure it must be the most elegant and captivating in the world. I am impatient to know it. We'll have no other instrument in Spain, and I will study to become its master, that I may woo you with its music. Charming Olivia, tell me, is it a harpsichord, a pianoforte, a pentachord, a harp? You have it, you have it. A harp, yes, a Jew's harp is, to me, the only instrument. Are you not charmed with the delightful hum of its bass, running on the ear like the distant rumble of a state coach? It presents the idea of vastness and importance to the mind. The moment you are its master, I'll give you my hand. Dear Capo, madam, dear Capo, a Jew's harp? Bless me, sir, don't I tell you so? Violins chill me. Clarinets, by sympathy, hurt my lungs. And instead of maintaining a band under my roof, I would not keep a servant who knew a bassoon from a flute or could tell whether he heard a jig or a canzonetta. Oh, thou great perverse one! You know you love concerts. You know you do. I detest them. It's vulgar custom that attaches people to the sound of fifty different instruments at once. T'would be as well to talk on the same subject in fifty different tongues. A band, tis a mere oleo of sound. I'd rather listen to a three-stringed guitar serenading a sempstress in some neighboring garret. Oh, you, Don Vincentio. Crosses center. This is nothing but perverseness, wicked perverseness. Hussy, didn't you shake when you mentioned a garret? Didn't bread and water and a stepmother come into your head at the same time? Piano, piano, good sir. Spare yourself all farther trouble. Should the princess of Gazarat and all her diamond mines offer themselves, I would not accept them in lieu of my band, a band that has half ruined me to collect. I would have allowed Donna Olivia a blooming garden in winter. I would even have procured barrenness and snow for her in the dog days. But to have my band insulted, to have my knowledge in music slighted, to be roused from all the energies of composition by the drone of a Jew's harp, I cannot breathe under the idea. Then you refuse her, sir? I cannot use so harsh a word. I take my leave of the lady. Adieu, madam. I leave you to enjoy your solos while I fly to the raptures of a crash. Exit left. Caesar goes up to her and looks her in the face, then goes off without speaking left. Mercy, that silent anger is terrifying. I read a young mother-in-law and an old lady abbess in every line of his face. And her Victoria, right. Well, you heard the whole, I suppose. Heard poor unhappy me scorned and rejected. I heard you in imminent danger, and expected Signor da Capo would have snapped you up in spite of caprice and extravagance. Oh, they charmed, instead of scaring him. I soon found that my only chance was to fall across his caprice. Where is the philosopher who could withstand that? But what, my good cousin, does all this tend to? I dare say you can guess. Penelope had never cheated her lovers with a never-ending web, had she not had a Ulysses. A Ulysses? What, are you then married? Oh, no, not yet. 
But believe me, my design is not to lead apes, nor is my heart an icicle. If you choose to know more, put on your veil and slip with me through the garden to the Prado. I can't, indeed. I am this moment going to dress en homme to visit the impatient Portuguese. Send an excuse, for positively you go with me. Heaven and earth I am going to meet a man whom I have been fool enough to dream and think of these two years, and I don't know that he ever thought of me in his life. Two years discovering that? He has been abroad. The only time I ever saw him was in the Duchess of Medina's. There were a thousand people, and he was so elegant, so careless, so handsome. In a word, though he set off for France the next morning, by some witchcraft or other, he has been before my eyes ever since. Was the impression mutual? He hardly noticed me. I was then a bashful thing, just out of a convent, and shrunk from observation. Why, I thought you were going to meet him. To be sure. I sent him a command this morning to be at the Prado. I am determined to find out if his heart is engaged. And if it is... You'll cross your arms and crown your brow with willows? No, positively. Not whilst we have myrtles. I would prefer Julio, tis true, to all his sex. But if he is stupid enough to be insensible to me... I shan't, for that reason, pine like a girl, on chalk and oatmeal. No, no, in that case, I shall form a new plan and treat my future lovers with more civility. <laughs> you are the only woman in love I ever heard talk reasonably. Well, prepare for the Prado, and I'll give you a lesson against your days of widowhood. Don't you wish this moment, Victoria? A pretty widow at four-and-twenty has more subjects and a wider empire than the first monarch upon the earth. I long to see you in your weeds. Never may you see them. Oh, Olivia, my happiness, my life depend on my husband. The fond hope of still being united to him gives me spirits in my affliction and enables me to support even the period of his neglect with patience. Exeunt. Right. End of Act Two. Act Three of A Bold Stroke for a Husband by Hannah Cowley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One A Long Street. Julio enters from a garden gate in flat with precipitation. A servant within fastens the gate. Yes, yes, bar the gate fast, Cerberus, lest some other curious traveller should stumble on your confines. If ever I am so caught again. Garcia enters left. Going hastily across, Julio seizes him. Don Garcia, never make love to a woman in a veil. Why so, prithee? Veils and secrecy are the chief ingredients in a Spanish amour. But in two years, Julio, thou art grown absolutely French. That may be, but if ever I trust to a veil again, may no lovely, blooming beauty ever trust me. Why dost know I have been an hour at the feet of a creature whose first birthday must have been kept the latter end of the last century, and whose trembling, weak voice I mistook for the timid cadence of bashful fifteen. Oh, what a happiness to have seen thee in thy raptures petitioning for half a glance only of the charms the envious veil concealed. Yes, and when she unveiled her gothic countenance, to render the thing completely ridiculous, she began moralizing, and positively would not let me out of the snare, till I had persuaded her she had worked a conversion, and that I'd never make love, but in an honest way, again. 
oh that honest way of love-making is delightful to be sure i had a dose of it this morning but happily the ladies have not yet learned to veil their tempers though they have their faces and her don vincentio right julio garcia congratulate me such an escape what have you escaped matrimony nay then our congratulations may be mutual i've had a matrimonial escape too this very day i was almost on the brink of the ceremony with the veriest xantippa oh that was not my case mine was a sweet creature all elegant all life then where's the cause of congratulation cause why she's ignorant of music prefers a jig to a casanetta and a jew's harp to a pentachord had my nymph no other fault i would pardon that for she was lovely and rich mine too was lovely and rich and i'll be sworn as ignorant of scolding as of the gamba but not to know music gentle lovely and rich and ignorant only of music a venial crime indeed if the sweet creature will marry me she shall carry a jew's harp always in her train as a scotch laird does his bagpipes i wish you'd give me your interest oh most willingly if thou hast so gross an inclination i'll name thee as a dull-souled largo fellow to her father don cesar cesar what don cesar de zonica impossible oh i'll answer for her mother so much is don zuniga her father that he does not know a semi-breve from a culverin the name of the lady olivia why you must be mad that's my termagant termagant <laughs> thou hast certainly some vixen of a mistress who infects thy ears towards the whole sex olivia is timid and elegant by juno there never existed such a scold by orpheus there never was a gayer tempered creature spirit enough to be charming that's all if she loved harmony i'd marry her to-morrow ha <laughs> ha what a ridiculous jangle tis evident you speak of two different women i speak of donna olivia heiress to don cesar de zuniga i speak of the heiress of don cesar de zuniga who is called donna olivia sir i perceive you mean to insult me your perceptions are very rapid sir but if you choose to think so i'll settle that point with you immediately but for fear of consequences i'll fly home and add the last bar to my concerto and then meet you where you please oh, this is evidently misapprehension to clear the matter up i'll visit the lady if you'll introduce me vincentio but you shall both promise to be governed in this dispute by my decision i'll introduce you with joy if you'll try to persuade her of the necessity of music and the charms of harmony yes she needs that you'll find her all jar and discord come no more garcia thou art but a sort of male vixen thyself melodious vincentio when shall i expect you this evening uh, not this evening i have engaged to meet a goldfinch in a grove then i shall have music you rogue it won't sing at night then i'll talk to it till the morning and hear it pour out its matins to the rising sun call on me to-morrow i'll then attend you to donna olivia and declare faithfully the impression her character makes on me come garcia i must not leave you together lest his crochets and your minimus should fall into a crash of discord Exeunt Vincentio left, Julio and Garcia right. Scene two, the Prado, enter Don Carlos right. 
All hail to the powers of Burgundy. Three flasks to my own share. What sorrows can stand against three flasks of Burgundy? I was a damn melancholy fellow this morning, going to shoot myself to get rid of my troubles. Where are my troubles now? Gone to the moon to look for my wits, and there I hope they'll remain together if one cannot come back without t'other. But where is this indolent dog, Yulio? He fit to receive appointments from ladies? Sure I have not missed the hour. Looking at his watch. No, but seven yet. Seven's the hour, by all the joys of Burgundy. The rogue must be here. Let's reconnoiter. Retires right. Enter Victoria and Olivia, veiled, left upper entrance. Positively mine's a pretty spark to let me be first at the place of appointment. I have half resolved to go home again to punish him. I'll answer for its being but half a resolution. To make it entire would be to punish yourself. There's a solitary man. Is not that he? I think not. If he'd please to turn his face this way. Oh, that's impossible while the lodestone is the other way. He is looking at the woman in the next walk. Can't you disturb him? Olivia screams. Oh, a frightful frog! Carlos turns on right. Heavens, this is my husband. Your husband? Is that Don Carlos? It is indeed. Why, really now I see the man. I don't wonder that you are in no hurry for your weeds. He is moving towards us. I cannot speak to him, and yet my soul flies to meet him. Pray, lady, what occasion that pretty scream? I shrewdly suspect it was a trap. A trap? <laughs> a trap for you. Why not, madam? Zounds, a man near six feet high and three flasks of burgundy in his head is worth laying a trap for. Yes, unless he happens to be trapped before. Tis about two years since you was caught, I take it. Do keep farther off. Odious, a married man. The devil! Is it posted under every saint in the street that I am a married man? No, you carry the marks about you. That rueful fizz could never belong to a bachelor. Besides, there's an odd appearance on your temples. Does your hat sit easily? By all the thorns of matrimony, if... Poor man, how natural to swear by what one feels. But why were you in such haste to gather the thorns of matrimony? Bless us, had you but looked about you a little, what a market might have been made of that fine, proper, promising person of yours. Confound thee, confound thee. If thou art a wife, may thy husband plague thee with jealousies and thou never be able to give him cause for them. And if thou art a maid, mayst thou be an old one. Going right meets Don Julio. Oh, Julio, look not that way. There's a tongue will stun thee. Heaven be praised. I love female prattle. A woman's tongue can never scare me. Which of these two goldfinches makes the music? Carlos crosses to Victoria. Oh, this is as silent as a turtle. Taking Victoria's hand. 
only coos now and then perhaps you don't hate a married man sweet one you guess right i love a married man ah sayest thou so wilt thou love me will you let me let thee my charmer how i'll cherish thee for it what would i not give for thy heart i demand a price that perhaps you cannot give i ask unbounded love but you have a wife and therefore the readier to love every other woman tis in your favour child will you love me ever ever yes ever till we find each other dull company and yawn and talk of our neighbours for amusement <laughs> farewell i suspected you to be a bad chapman and that you would not reach my terms going nay i'll come to your terms if i can but move this way crosses left i am fearful of that woodpecker at your elbow should she begin again her noise will scare all the pretty loves that are playing about my heart don't turn your head towards them if you like to listen to love tales you'll meet fond pairs enough in this walk forcing her gently off i really believe though you deny it that you are my destiny that is you fated me hither see is not this your mandate taking a letter from his pocket oh delightful the scrawl of some chambermaid or perhaps of your valet to give you an air what is it signed maria tournay's tomasa sancha nay now i am convinced the letter is yours since you abuse it so you may as well confess suppose i should you can't be sure that i do not deceive you true but there is one point in which i have made a vow not to be deceived therefore the preliminary is that you throw off your veil my veil positively if you reject this article our negotiation ends you have no right to offer articles unless you own yourself conquered i own myself willing to be conquered and have therefore a right to make the best terms i can do you accede to the demand certainly not you had better i protest i will not Julio aside my life upon it i make you why madam how absurd this is yet tis of no consequence for i know your features as well as though i saw them how can that be i judge of what you hide by what i see i could draw your picture charming pray begin the portrait in primus a broad high forehead rounded at the top like an old-fashioned gateway oh horrid little gray eyes a sharp nose and hair the color of rusty prunella odious pale cheeks thin lips and hold hold thou vilifier throws off her veil he sinks on one knee there yes kneel in contrition for your malicious libel say rather in adoration what a charming creature so now for lies on the other side a forehead formed by the graces hair which cupid would steal for his bowstrings were he not engaged in shooting through those sparkling hazel circlets which nature has given you for eyes 
lips that twere a sin to call so they are fresh gathered rose leaves with the fragrant morning dew still hanging on their rounded surface is that extemporaneous or ready cut for every woman who takes off her veil to you i believe tis not extemporaneous for nature when she finished you formed the sentiment in my heart and there it has been hid till you for whom it was formed called it into words suppose i should understand from all this that you have a mind to be in love with me would not you be finely caught charmingly caught if you'll let me understand at the same time that you have a mind to be in love with me in love with a man heavens i never loved anything but a squirrel make me your squirrel i'll put on your chain and gamble and play for ever at your side but suppose you should have a mind to break the chain then loosen it for if once that humour seizes me restraint won't cure it let me spring and bound at liberty and when i return to my lovely mistress tired of all but her fasten me again to your girdle and kiss me while you chide your servant to encourage you to leave me again no to make returning to you the strongest attraction to my life why are you silent i am debating whether to be pleased or displeased at what you have said well you shall know when i have determined my friend and yours are approaching this way and they must not be interrupted it would be barbarous we'll retire as far off as you please but we retire separately sir that lady is a woman of honour and this moment of the greatest importance to her you may however conduct me to the gate on condition that you leave me instantly leave her instantly oh then i know my cue exit together right upper entrance enter carlos left followed by victoria unveiled carlos looking back on her my wife oh heavens i will veil myself again i will hide my face forever from you if you will still feast my ears with those soft vows which a moment since you poured forth so eagerly my wife making love to my own wife why should one of the dearest moments of my life be to you so displeasing so i am caught in this snare by way of agreeable surprise i suppose <sighs> would you could think it so no madam by heaven tis a surprise fatal to every hope with which you may have flattered yourself what am i to be followed haunted watched not to upbraid you i followed you because my castle without you seemed a dreary desert indeed i will never upbraid you generous assurance never upbraid me no by heavens i'll take care you never shall aside she has touched my soul but i dare not yield to the impression her softness is worse than death to me <sighs> would i could find words to please you you cannot therefore leave me or suffer me to go without attempting to follow me is it possible you can be so barbarous do not expostulate your first vow duty is obedience that word so grating to your sex to me it was never grating to obey you has been my joy 
even now i will not dispute your will though i feel for the first time obedience hateful going and then turning back oh carlos my dear carlos i go but my soul remains with you exit left oh horrible had i not taken this harsh measure i must have killed myself for how could i tell her that i have made her a beggar better she should hate detest me than that my tenderness should give her a prospect of felicity which now she can never taste oh wine created spirit where art thou now madness return to me again for reason presents me with nothing but despair enter julio from the top right upper entrance carlos who the devil can they be my charming little witch was inflexible i hope yours has been more communicative folly nonsense folly nonsense what a pretty woman's smile but you married fellows have neither taste nor joy <sighs> crosses and exit right pshaw that's a husband <laughs> suppose my fair one should want to debase me into such an animal she can't have so much villainy in her disposition and yet if she should oh <laughs> it won't bear thinking about if i do so mad a thing it must be as cowards fight without daring to reflect on the danger exit right scene three an apartment in the house of don vasquez marcella's father enter don caesar and don vasquez left well don vasquez and uh you th then i say you have a mind that i should marry your daughter it is sufficient signor that you have signified to us your intention my daughter shall prove her gratitude in her attention to your felicity caesar aside egad now it comes to the bush em em but just nineteen you say exactly the eleventh of last month pity it was not twenty why a year can make no difference i should think oh yes it does years a great deal they are so skittish at nineteen those who are skittish at nineteen i fear you won't find much mended at twenty marcella is very grave and a pretty little plump fair ay fair again pity she isn't brown or olive i like your olives brown and olive you are very whimsical my old friend why these fair girls are so stared at by the men and the young fellows nowadays have a damned impudent stare with them tis very abashing to a woman very distressing yes so it is but happily their distress is of that nature that it generally goes off in a simper but come i'll send marcella to you and she will no no stay my good friend gasping you are in a violent hurry why truly signor at our time of life when we determine to marry we have no time to lose why that's very true and so aside oh st anthony now it comes to the point but there can be no harm in looking at her a look won't bind us for better for worse well then if you have a mind i say you may let me see her exit vasquez right caesar puts on his spectacles ay here she comes i hear her trip 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 i don't like that step a woman should always tread steadily with dignity 
It awes the men. Enter Vasquez, leading Marcella, right. There, Marcella, behold your future husband, and remember that your kindness to him will be the standard of your duty to me. Exit, right. Marcella, aside. Oh, heavens! Somehow, I am afraid to look around. Surely he does not know that I am here. <coughs> so, she knows how to give an item, I find. Pray, senor, have you any commands for me? Hmm, not nonplussed at all. Looks around. Oh, that eye. I don't like that eye. My father commanded me. Yes, I know. I know. Aside. Why, now I look again. There is a sort of a modest... Oh, that smile. That smile will never do. I understand, senor that you have demanded my hand in marriage. Caesar, aside. Upon my word, plump to the point. Yes, I did a sort of, I can't say, but that I did. I am not insensible of the honor you do me, sir, but, but. But, what? Don't you like the thoughts of the match? Oh, yes, sir, yes, exceedingly. Aside. I dare not say no. Oh, you do, exceedingly. What, I suppose, child? Your head is full of jewels and finery and equipage? No, indeed, sir. No? What then? What sort of a life do you expect to lead when you are my wife? What pleasures do you look forward to? None. Eh? I shall obey my father, sir. I shall marry you. But I shall be most wretched. <laughs> Indeed. There is not a fate I would not prefer. But pardon me. Go on. Go on. I never was better pleased. Pleased at my reluctance? Never, never better pleased in my life. So you had really, now, you young baggage, rather have me for a grandfather than a husband? Forgive my frankness, sir, a thousand times. My dear girl, let me kiss your hand. Egad, you've let me off charmingly. I was frightened out of my wits, lest you should have taken as violent an inclination to the match as your father has. Dear sir, you charm me. But hark ye, you'll certainly incur your father's anger if I don't take the refusal entirely on myself, which I will do if you'll only assist me in a little business I have in hand. Anything to show my gratitude. You must know, I can't get my daughter to marry. There's nothing on earth will drive her to it, but the dread of a mother-in-law. Now, if you will let it appear to her that you and I are driving to the goal of matrimony, I believe it will do. What say you? Shall we be lovers in play? If you are sure it will be only in play. Oh, my life upon it. But we must be very fond, you know. To be sure, exceedingly tender. <laughs> you must smile upon me now and then, roguishly, and slide your hand into mine when you are sure she sees you, and let me pat your cheek and... Oh, no farther, pray. That will be quite sufficient. Gad, I begin to take a fancy to your rogue's face. Now I'm in no danger. Mayn't we... Mayn't we salute sometimes? 
it will seem infinitely more natural. Never. Such an attempt would make me fly off at once. Well, you must be Lady Governess in this business. I'll go home now and fret, madam, about her young mother-in-law. Bye, sweeting. Bye, charmer. Oh, bless its pretty eyes. Exit left. Bless its pretty spectacles. <laughs> Enter into a league with a cross old father against a daughter. Why, how could he suspect me capable of so much treachery? I could not answer it to my conscience. No, no, I'll acquaint Donna Olivia with the plot. And, as in duty bound, we'll turn our arms against Don Caesar. Exit, right. End of Act Three. Act Four of A Bold Stroke for a Husband by Hannah Cowley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene One Donna Laura's. Enter Donna Laura and Pedro, right. Well, Pedro, hast thou seen Don Florio? Yes, Donna. How did he look when he read my letter? Mortal well. I've never seen him look better. He got the new cloak and the... Foul blockhead! Did he look pleased? Did he kiss my name? Did he press the billet to his bosom with all the warmth of love? No, he didn't warm in that way, but he did another, for he put it in the fire. How? Yes, when I spoke, he started, for I think he had forgot I was by. So, says he, go home and tell Donna Laura I fly to her presence. She waves her hand for him to go. Is it possible, so contemptuously to destroy the letter in which my whole heart overflowed with tenderness? Oh, how idly I talk. He is here. His very voice pierces my heart. I dare not meet his eye thus discomposed. Exit right. And her Victoria left in men's clothes, preceded by Sancha. I will inform my mistress that you are here, Don Florio. I thought she had been in the apartment. Exit left. <sighs> now must I, with a mind torn by anxieties, once more assume the lover of my husband's mistress, of the woman who has robbed me of his heart, and his children of their fortune. Sure, my task is hard. O oh, love, O oh, married love, assist me. If I can by any art obtain from her that fatal deed, I shall save my little ones from ruin, and then... But I hear her step. Agitated, pressing her hand on her bosom. There, I have hid my griefs within my heart. And now for all the impudence of an accomplished cavalier. Sings an air, sets her hat in the glass, dances a few steps, etc., then runs to Laura right and seizes her hand. Ah, oh, my lovely Laura. That look speaks Laura loved as well as lovely. To be sure, Petrarch immortalized his Laura by his verses, and mine shall be immortal in my passion. Oh, Florio, how deceitful! I know not what enchantment binds me to thee. Me, my dear, is all this to me? Playing carelessly with the feather in her hat. Yes, ingrate, thee. Positively, Laura, you have these extravagancies so often, I wonder my passion can stand them. To be plain, those violences in your temper may make a pretty relief in the flat of matrimony, child. But they do not suit that state of freedom which is necessary to my happiness. It was by such destructive arts as these you cured Don Carlos of his love. Cured Don Carlos? Oh, Florio, wert thou but as he is. Why? You don't pretend he loves you still? Yes, most ardently and truly. Ha! Huh. If thou wouldst persuade me that thy passion is real, Borrow his words, his looks, 
be a hypocrite one dear moment and speak to me in all the frenzy of that love which warms the heart of Carlos. The heart of Carlos. Laura, aside. Ha! Huh, that seemed a jealous pang. It gives my hopes new life. Yes, Florio. He, indeed, knows what it is to love. For me, he forsook a beauteous wife. Nay, and with me, he would forsake his country. Villain! Villain! Nay, let not the thought distress you thus. Carlos, I despise. He is the weakest of mankind. Tis false, madam. You cannot despise him. Carlos, the weakest of mankind? Heavens! What woman could resist him? Persuasion sits on his tongue, and love, almighty love, triumphant in his eyes. This is strange. You speak of your rival with the admiration of a mistress. Laura, it is the fate of jealousy as well as love to see the charms of its object increased and heightened. I am jealous, jealous to distraction of Don Carlos, and cannot taste peace unless you'll swear never to see him more. I swear, joyfully swear, never to behold or speak to him again. When, dear youth, shall we retire to Portugal? We are not safe here. You know I am not rich. You must first sell the lands my rival gave you. Observing her with apprehension. Tis done. I have found a purchaser, and tomorrow the transfer will be finished. Victoria aside. Ah, oh, I have now then nothing to trust to but the ingenuity of Gaspar. <clears throat> there is reason to fear Don Carlos had no right in that estate with which you supposed yourself endowed. No right? What could have given you those suspicions? A conversation with Juan, his steward, who assures me his master never had an estate in Lyon. Never? What, not by marriage? Juan says so. Oh, my blood runs cold. Can I have taken pains to deceive myself? Could I think so, I should be mad. These doubts may soon be annihilated or confirmed to certainty. I have seen Don Sancho, the uncle of Victoria. He is now in Madrid. You have told me that he once professed a passion for you. Oh, to excess, but at that time I had another object. Have you conversed with him much? I never saw him nearer than from my balcony, where he used to ogle me through a glass suspended by a ribbon, like an order of knighthood. He is weak enough to fancy it gives him an air of distinction. <laughs> but where can I find him? I must see him. Write him a billet, and I will send it to his lodgings. Instantly. Dear Florio, a new prospect opens to me. Don Sancho is rich and generous, and by playing on his passions, his fortune may be a constant fun to us. I'll dip my pen in flattery. Exit right. Base woman, how can I pity thee, or regret the steps which my duty obliges me to take? For myself I would not swerve from the nicest line of rectitude, nor wear the shadow of deceit. But for my children, is there a parental heart that will not pardon me? Exit right. Scene two, Don Caesar's. And her Olivia and Minette. Well, here we are in private. What is this charming intelligence of which thou art so full this morning? Why, ma'am, as I was in the balcony that overlooks Don Vasquez's garden, Doña Marcella told me that Don Cesar had last night been to pay her a visit previous to their marriage, and... Their marriage? How can you give me the intelligence with such a look of joy? Their marriage? What will become of me? Dear ma'am, if you'll but have patience, he says that... Don Cesar and she are perfectly agreed. Still with that smirking face? I can't have patience. Then, madam, if you won't let me tell the story, please to read it. Here's a letter from Doña Marcella. Why did you not give it to me at first? 
reads. Because I didn't like to be cut out of my story. If orators were obliged to come to the point at once, mercy on us, what tropes and figures we should lose. Oh, Manette, I give you leave to that smirk again. Listen. Reads. I am more terrified at the idea of becoming your father's wife than you are in expectation of a stepmother. And Don Caesar would be as loath as either of us. He only means to frighten you into matrimony. And I have, on certain conditions, agreed to assist him. But whatever you may hear or see, be assured that nothing is so impossible as that he should become the husband of Donna Marcella. Oh, delightful girl! How I love her for this! Yes, ma'am. And if you'd had patience, I should have told you that she's now here with Don Cesar in grave debate how to begin the attack, which must force you to take shelter in the arms of her husband. Ah, uh, no matter how they begin it, let them amuse themselves in raising batteries. My reserved fire shall tumble them about their ears in the moment my poor father is singing his ayos for victory. But there comes the lovers. Well, I protest now, sixteen and sixty is a very comely sight. Tis contrast gives effect to everything. Lud, how my father ogles. I had no idea he was such a sort of man. I am really afraid he isn't quite so good as he used to be. Enter Don Caesar, leading Marcella. Don Caesar, apart. Hum. Um. Madam looks very placid. We shall discompose her, or oh, I am mistaken. So, Olivia, here's Donna Marcella I come to visit you, though, as matters are, that respect is due from you. I am sensible of the condescension. My dear ma'am, how very good this is. Taking her hand. Caesar aside. Yes, you'll think yourself wonderfully obliged when you know all. Pray, Donna Marcella, what do you think of these apartments? The furniture and decorations are my daughter's taste. Would you wish them to remain, or will you give orders to have them changed? Changed, undoubtedly. I can have nobody's taste govern my apartments but my own. Don Caesar, apart. Ah, that touches. See how she looks. They shall receive your orders, you understand, I suppose, from this that everything is fixed on between Donna Marcella and me. Yes, sir. I understand it perfectly. And it gives me infinite pleasure. They? Pleasure? Entirely, sir. Tol du Rol. Ah, that won't do. That won't do. You can't hide it. You are frightened out of your wits at the thoughts of a mother-in-law, especially a young, gay, handsome one. Pardon me, sir. The thought of a mother-in-law was indeed disagreeable, but her being young and gay qualifies it. I hope, ma'am, you'll give us balls and the most spirited parties. You can't think how stupid we have been. My dear father hates those things, but I hope now. Hey, 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 what's the meaning of all this? Why, hussy, don't you know you'll have no apartment but the garret? That will benefit my complexion, sir, by mending my health. Tis charming to sleep in an elevated situation. Here, here's an obstinate, perverse slut. Bless me, sir. Are you angry that I look forward to your marriage without murmuring? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. You ought to murmur, and you ought to, to, to... Dear me, I find love 
taken up late in life, has a bad effect on the temper. I wish, my dear papa, you had felt the influence of Donna Marcella's charms somewhat sooner. You do? You do? Why, this must be all put on. This can't be real. Indeed, indeed it is. And I protest, your engagement with this lady has given me more pleasure than I have tasted ever since you began to tease me about a husband. You seem determined to have a marriage in the family, and I hope now I shall live in quiet with my dear, sweet, young mother-in-law. Oh! Oh! Walking about. Was there ever? She doesn't care for a mother-in-law. Can't frighten her. Sure, my fate is very peculiar. That being pleased with your choice and submitting with humble duty to your will should be the cause of offence. I see. I don't want you to be pleased with my choice. I don't want you to submit with humble duty to my will. Where I do want you to submit, you rebel. You are a... you are... But I mortify that wayward spirit yet. Exit Don Caesar and Marcella, right. Well, really, my master is in a piteous passion. He seems more angry at your liking his marriage and at your refusing to be married yourself. Wouldn't it have been better, madam, to have affected discontent? To what purpose but to lay myself open to fresh solicitations in order to get rid of the evil I pretended to dread? Bless us, nothing can be more easy than for my father to be gratified, if he were but lucky in the choice of a lover. As much as to say, madam, that there is... Why, yes, as much as to say, I see you are resolved to have my secret, Minette, and so... And her servant left. There is a gentleman at the door, madam, called Don Julio de Melisina. He waits on you from Don Vincencio. Who? Don Julio? It cannot be. Art thou sure of his name? The servant repeated it twice. He is in a fine carriage and seems to be a nobleman. Conduct him hither. Exit servant. Olivia aside. I am astonished. I cannot see him. I would not have him know the incognita to be Olivia for worlds. There is but one way. Minette, ask no questions, but do as I order you. Receive Don Julio in my name. Call yourself the heiress of Don Caesar, and on no account suffer him to believe that you are anything else. Exit, right. So then, this is some new lover she is determined to disgust and fancies that making me pass for her will complete it. Perhaps her ladyship may be mistaken, though. Looking through the wind. Upon my word, a sweet man. Oh, Lord, my heart beats at the very idea of his making love to me, even though he takes me for another. Stay, I think he shan't find me here. Standing in the middle of a room gives one's appearance no effect. I'll enter upon him with an easy swim, or an engaging trip, or a something that shall strike. The first glance is everything. Exit, right. Enter Don Julio, left, preceded by a servant who retires right. Not here. The ridiculous dispute between Garcia and Vincentio gives me irresistible curiosity, though... If she is the character Garcia describes, I expect to be cuffed for my impertinence. Here she comes. A pretty, smiling girl. Faith for a vixen. And her Minette write very affectedly. Sir, your most obedient, humble servant. Uh, you are Don Julio de Melesina. I am extremely glad to see you, sir. Julio, aside. A very courteous reception. You honor me infinitely, madam. I must apologize for waiting on you without a better introduction. Don Vincentio promised to attend me. 
but a concert called him to another part of the town at the moment i prepared to come hither a concert yes sir he's very fond of music he is madam you i suppose have a passion for that charming science oh yes i love it mightily julio aside this is lucky i think i have heard donna olivia that your taste that way is peculiar you are fond of a aside faith i can hardly speak it of a jew's harp <laughs> smothering a laugh a jew's harp mercy what do you think a person of my birth and figure can have such fancies as that no sir i love fiddles french horns tabors and all the cheerful noisy instruments in the world julio aside vincentio must have been mad and i as mad as he to mention it then you are fond of concerts madam dote on them aside i wish he'd offer me a ticket julio aside vincentio is clearly wrong now to prove how far the other was right in supposing her a vixen there is a grand public concert sir to be to-morrow pray do you go i believe i shall have that pleasure madam my father don't say so won't let me purchase a ticket i think it's very hard pardon me i think it's perfectly right right what to refuse me a trifling expense that would procure me a great pleasure yes doubtless the ladies are too fond of pleasure i think don cesar is exemplary lord sir you think it very hard if you were me to be locked up all your life and know nothing of the world but what you could catch through the bars of your balcony perhaps i might but as a man i am convinced tis right daughters and wives should be equally excluded those destructive haunts of dissipation let them keep to their embroidery nor ever presume to show their faces but at their own firesides aside this will bring out the xantippe surely well sir i don't know to be sure home as you say is the fittest place for women for my part i could live for ever at home aside i'm determined he shall have his way who knows what may happen julio aside by all the powers of caprice garcia is as wrong as the other i delight in nothing so much as in sitting by my father and hearing his tales of old times and i fancy when i have a husband i shall be more happy to sit and listen to his stories of present times perhaps your husband fair lady might not be inclined so to amuse you men have a thousand delights that call them abroad and probably your chief amusements would be counting the hours of his absence and giving a tear to each as it passed well he should never see them however i would always smile when he entered and if he found my eyes red i'd say i had been weeping over the history of the unfortunate damsel whose true love hung himself at sea and appeared to her afterwards in a wet jacket aside sure this will do i am every moment more astonished pray madam permit me a question are you really yet i cannot doubt it are you really donna olivia the daughter of don cesar to whom don garcia and don vincentio had lately the honour of paying their addresses am i donna olivia <laughs> what a question pray sir is this my father's house are you don julio i beg your pardon but to confess i had heard you described as a lady who had not quite so much sweetness and 
"Oh, what you had heard! That I was a termagant, I suppose. It is all slander, sir. There is not in Madrid, though I say it, a sweeter temper than my own. And though I have refused a good many lovers, yet if one was to offer himself that I could like... You would take pity and reward his passion. I would. Lovely Donna Olivia, how charming is this frankness. Aside. Tis a little odd, though. Why, I believe I should take pity, for it always seemed to me to be very hot-hearted to be cruel to a lover that one likes, because in that case one should, uh, you know, sir, the sooner the affair is over, the better for both parties. Julio, aside. What the deuce does she mean? Is this Garcia's sour fruit? Caesar, without. Olivia! Olivia! Bless me, I hear my father. Now, sir, I have a particular fancy that you should not tell him in this first visit your design. Madam? my design yes that you will not speak out till we have had a little further conversation which i'll take care to give you an opportunity for very soon he'll be here in a moment now pray don julio go if he should meet you and ask who you are you can say that you are you may say that you came on a visit to my maid you know exit right i thank you madam aside for my dismission. I never was in such a peril in my life. I believe she has a license in her pocket, a priest in her closet, and the ceremony by heart. Exit. End of Act Four. Act Five of A Bold Stroke for a Husband by Hannah Cowley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scene 1. Don Carlos's. Don Carlos discovered writing. Carlos tearing paper and rising. It is in vain. Language cannot furnish me with terms to soften to Victoria the horrid transaction. Could she see the compunction of my soul, her gentle heart would pity me. But what then? She's ruined. My children are undone. Oh, the artifices of one base woman, and my villainy to another most amiable one, have made me unfit to live. I am a wretch who ought to be blotted from society. Enter Pedro hastily, left. Sir, sir. Well? Sir, I have just met Don Florio. He asked if my mistress was at home, so I guess he is going to our house, and so I run to let you know, for I loves to keep my promises, though I am deadly afraid of some mischief. You have done well. Go home and wait for me at the door, and admit me without noise. Exit Pedro, left. At least, then, I shall have the pleasure of revenge. I'll punish that harlot by sacrificing her paramour in her arms. And then... Oh! Exit, left. Scene 2. Dona Laura's. Enter Laura, left, with precipitation, followed by Victoria. Tis his carriage! How successful was my letter! This, my Florio, is a most important moment. It is indeed, and I will leave you to make every advantage of it. If I am present, I must witness condescensions from you that I shall not be able to bear, though I know them to be but affected. Aside. Now, Gasper, play thy part well and safe, Victoria. Exit right. And her Gasper left dressed as an old beau. Two servants follow him and take off a rich cloak. Take my cloak, and, do you hear, Ricardo, go home and bring the eider-down cushions for the coach, 
and tell the fellow not to hurry me post through the streets of Madrid. Exeunt servants left. I have been jolted from side to side, like a pippin in a mill stream. Drive a man of my rank, as he would a city vintner and his fat wife going to a bullfight. Ah, there she is. Looking through a glass suspended by a red ribbon. There she is, charming Donna Laura. Let me thus at the shrine of your beauty. Makes an effort to kneel and falls on his face. Laura assists him to rise. Fie, fie those new shoes. They have made me skate all day like a Dutchman on a canal. And now, well, you see how profound my adoration is, madam. Common lovers kneel. I was prostrate. You do me infinite honor. Aside. Disgustful wretch. You are thinner than you were, Don Sancho. I protest, now I observe you, you are much altered. I, madam, fretting, your absence threw me into a fever, and that destroyed my bloom. You see, I look almost a middle-aged man now. No, really, far from it, I assure you. Aside. The fop is as wrinkled as a baboon. Then jealousy, that gave me a jaundice. My niece's husband, I hear, Don Carlos, has been my happy rival. Oh, my blade will hardly keep in its scabbard when I think of him. Think no more of him. He has been long banished, my thoughts be assured. I wonder you gave your niece to him with such a fortune. Gave? She gave herself. And, as to fortune, she had not a pistole for me. "'Twas indeed unnecessary, with so fine an estate as she had in Lyon. "'My niece an estate in Lyon. Not enough to give shelter to a field mouse, and if he has told you so, he is a braggart. "'Told me so? I have the writings. He has made over the lands to me.' "'Made over the lands to you? Oh, a deceiver! I begin to suspect a plot.' Pray, let me see this extraordinary deed. She runs to a cabinet, door in front. A plot. I'll be sworn. Here is the deed which made that estate mine for ever. No, sir, I will entrust it in no hand but my own. Yet look over me and read the description of the lands. Gasper, reading through his glass. Uh, um... In the vicinage of Ro Rosalvo, bounded on the west by the river, um, uh, on the east by the forest. Oh, an artful dog. I need read no further. I see how the thing is. How, sir? But hold. Stay a moment. I am breathless with fear. Nay. Madam, don't be afraid. Tis my estate, that's all. The very castle where I was born, and which I never did, nor ever will, bestow on any dawn in the two Castiles. Dissembling rogue! Bribe you with a fictitious title to my estate. <laughs> Laura, aside. Curses follow him. The villain I employed must have been his creature, his reluctance all art, and whilst I believed myself undoing him, was duped myself. Could you suppose I'd give Carlos such an estate for running away with my niece? No, no, the vineyards and the cornfields and the woods of Rosalvo are not for him. I've somebody else in my eye. In my eye, observe me, to give those two. Can't you guess who it is? No, indeed. Aside. Gives me a glimmering that saves me from despair. I won't tell you, unless you'll bribe me. I won't indeed. Kisses her cheek. There. Now I'll tell you. They are all for you. 
Yes, this estate to which you have taken such a fancy shall be yours. I'll give you the deeds, if you'll promise to love me, you little cruel thing. Can you be serious? I'll sign and seal tomorrow. Noble Don Sancho, thus then I annihilate the proof of his perfidy and my weakness. Thus I tear to Adams his detested name, and as I tread on these, so would I on his heart. Enter Victoria, right. Victoria in transport. My children then are saved. Laura apart. O oh, Florio, tis as thou saidest. Carlos was a villain and deceived me. Why this strange air? Oh, I see the cause. You think me ruined and will abandon me. Yes, I see it in thy averted face. Thou darest not meet my eyes. If I misjudge thee, speak. Laura, I cannot speak. You little guess the emotions of heart. Heaven knows I pity you. Pity? O oh, villain! And has thy love already snatched the form of pity? Base, deceitful! Carlos, without. Stand off! Loose your weak hold! I'm come for vengeance! Enter Carlos, left. Where is this youth? Where is the blooming rival for whom I have been betrayed? Hold me not, base woman. In vain the stripling flies me. For, by heaven, my sword shall in his bosom right its master's wrongs. Victoria first goes towards the flat, then returns, takes off her hat, and drops on one knee. Strike, strike it here. Plunge it deep into that bosom, already wounded by a thousand stabs, keener and more painful than your sword can give. Here lives all the gnawing anguish of love betrayed. Here live the pangs of disappointed hopes, hopes sanctified by holiest vows, which have been written in the book of heaven. <gasps> he sings. She flies to him. Oh, my Carlos, beloved, my husband, forgive my too severe reproaches. Thou art dear, yet dear as ever to Victoria's heart. Carlos, recovering. Oh, you know not what you do. You know not who you are. Oh, Victoria, thou art a beggar. No, we are rich, we are happy. See there, the fragments of that fatal deed, which, had I not recovered, we had been indeed undone, yet still not wretched. Could my Carlos think so? The fragments of the deed? The deed which that base woman... Speak not so harshly. To you, madam, I fear I seem reprehensible. Yet when you consider my duties as a wife and mother, you will forgive me. Be not afraid of poverty. A woman has deceived, but she will not desert you. Is this real? Can I be awake? Oh, mayst thou indeed awake to virtue. You have talents that might grace the highest of our sex. Be no longer unjust to such precious gifts by burying them in dishonour. Virtue is our first, most awful duty. Bow, Laura, bow before her throne, and mourn in ceaseless tears, that ever you forgot her heavenly precepts. So, by a smooth speech about virtue, you think to cover the injuries I sustain? Vile, insinuating monster! But thou knowest me not. Revenge is sweeter to my heart than love, and if there is a law in Spain to gratify that passion, your virtue shall have another field for exercise. Exit right. Carlos, turning towards Victoria. My hated rival and my charming wife. How many sweet mysteries have you to unfold? Oh, Victoria, my soul thanks thee 
but i dare not yet say i love thee till ten thousand acts of watchful tenderness have proved how deep the sentiments engraved can it be true that i have been unhappy but the mysteries my carlos are already explained to you gaspar's resemblance to my uncle yes sir i was always apt at resemblances in our plays at home i am always queen cleopatra you know she was but a gypsy queen and i hits her off to a nicety come my victoria oh there is a painful pleasure in my bosom to gaze on thee to listen to and to love thee seems like the bliss of angels cheering whispers to repentant sinners exeunt carlos and victoria left lord help em how easily the women are taken in exit left scene three the prado and her minette left ah here comes the man at last after i have been sauntering in sight of his lodging these two hours now if my scheme takes what a happy person i shall be and sure as i was doña olivia to-day to please my lady i may be doña olivia to-night to please myself i'll address him as the maid of a lady who has taken a fancy to him then convey him to our house then retire and then come in again and with a vast deal of confusion confess i sent my maid for him if he should dislike my forwardness the censure will fall on my lady if he should be pleased with my person the advantage will be mine but perhaps he's come here on some wicked frolic or other i'll watch him at a distance before i speak exit left upper entrance enter don julio right not here faith though she gave me last night but a faint refusal and i had a right by all the rules of gallantry to construe that into an assent then she's a jilt hang her i feel i am uneasy the first woman that ever gave me pain i am ashamed to perceive that this spot has attractions for me only because it was here i conversed with her twas here the little siren conscious of her charms unveiled her fascinating face twas here ha enter don garcia and don vincentio right upper entrance ha don julio pshaw gentlemen pray be quick twas here that julio leaving champagne untasted and songs of gallantry unsung came to talk to the whistling branches twas here that julio flying from the young and gay was found in doleful meditation on a wench for a hundred ducats who is she not donna olivia gentlemen not donna olivia we have been seeking you to ask the event of your visit to her the event has proved that you have been most grossly duped i know that <laughs> and you likewise i know that <laughs> the fair lady so far from being a vixen is the very essence of gentleness to me so much sweetness in a wife would be downright mawkish well but she's fond of a jew's harp detests it she would be as fond of a jew foe foe this is a game at cross purposes let us all go to don cesar's together and compare opinions on the spot i'll go most willingly but it will only be to cover you both with confusion for being the two men in spain most easily imposed on all going right and her minette left gentlemen my lady has sent me for one of you pray which of you is it julio returning me without doubt child i don't know that look at me my dear 
don't you think i am the man minette to garcia let me see a good air and well made you are the man for a dancer crosses to vincentio well dressed and nicely put out of hands you are the man for a bandbox crosses to julio handsome and bold you are the man for my lady my dear little iris here's all the gold in my pocket gentlemen i wish you a good night i am your very obedient humble stalking by them with his arm round minette foe prithee don't be a fool are we not going to donna olivia donna olivia must wait my dear boy we can decide about her to-morrow come along my little dove of venus exit left what a rash fellow it is ten to one but this is some common business and he'll be robbed and murdered they take him for a stranger let's follow and see where she leads him that's hardly fair however as i think there's danger we will follow exit left scene four don caesar's and her minette and don julio left there sir please to sit down till my lady is ready to wait on you she won't be long aside i'm sure she's out and i may do great things before she returns exit right through fifty back lanes a long garden and a narrow staircase into a superb apartment all that's in the regular way as the spanish women manage it one intrigue is too much like another if it was not now and then for the little lovely philip of a jealous husband or brother which obliges one to leap from a window or crawl like a cat along the gutters there would be no bearing the ennui ah ah but this promise is novelty looking through the wing a young girl and an old man wife or daughter they are coming this way my lovely incognita by all that's propitious why did not some kind spirit whisper to me my happiness but hold she can't mean to treat the old gentleman with a sight of me goes behind the sofa and her don caesar and olivia left no no madam no going out there madam this is your apartment your house your garden your assembly till you go to your convent why how impudent you are to look thus unconcerned can hardly forbear laughing in my face very well very well Exit, double locking the door, left. <laughs> I'll be even with you, my dear father, if you treble lock it. I'll stay here two days without once asking for my liberty, and you'll come on the third with tears in your eyes to take me out. He has forgot the door leading to the garden, but I vow I'll stay. Sitting down. I can make the time pass pleasantly enough i hope so looking over the back of the sofa heaven and earth my dear creature why are you so alarmed am i here before you expected me coming round right expected you oh this pretty surprise come let us sit down i think your father was very obliging to lock us in together olivia calling at the door sir sir my father Caesar without. Ay, tis all in vain. I won't come near you. There you are, and there you may stay. I shan't return. Make as much noise as you will. Why? Are you not ashamed that your father has so much more consideration for your guest than you have? Olivia aside. My guest? How is it possible he can have discovered me? Phew, this is carrying the thing further than you need. If there was a third person here, 
It might be prudent. Why, this assurance, Don Julio, is really... The thing in the world you are most ready to pardon. Upon my word, I don't know how to treat you. Consult your heart. I shall consult my honor. Honor is a pretty thing to play with. But when spoken with that very grave face, after having sent your maid to bring me here, is really more than I expected. I shall be in an ill humor presently. I won't stay if you treat me thus. Well, this is superior to everything. I have heard that men will slander women privately to each other. Tis their common amusement. But to do it to one's face. And you really pretend that I sent for you. <laughs> well, if it obliges you, I will pretend that you did not send for me, that your maid did not conduct me hither. Nay, that I have not now the supreme happiness. Catching her in his arms. And her manette. No! She runs out, right. Donna Olivia de Zuniga. How the devil came she here? Olivia aside. That's lucky. Olivia, my dear friend, why do you run away? Apart to Minette. Keep the character I charge you. Be still, Olivia. Oh, dear madam, I was... I was so frightened when I saw that gentleman. Oh, my dear, it's the merriest pretty kind of gentleman in the world. He pretends that I sent my maid for him into the streets. <laughs> That's right. Always tell a thing yourself, which you would not have believed. Minette, aside. It is the readiest excuse for being found in a lady's apartment, however. No, I will swear I know nothing of the matter. Olivia, apart. Now, I think it a horrid poor excuse. He has certainly not had occasion to invent reasons for such impertinencies often. Tell me that he has made love to you today. I fancy that he has had occasion to excuse impertinencies often. His impertinence to me today... To you, madam? Making love to me, my dear, all the morning. Could hardly get him away. He was so desirous to speak to my father. Nay, sir, I don't care for your impatience. Julio, aside. How would I give a thousand pistoles if she were a man? Nay, then, this accidental meeting is fortunate. Pray, Don Julio, don't let my presence prevent your saying what you think proper to my friend. Shall I leave you together? Julio, apart. To contradict a lady on such an assertion would be too gross. But upon my honor, Donna Olivia is the last woman upon earth who could inspire me with a tender idea. Find an excuse to send her away, my angel. I entreat you. I have a thousand things to say, and the moments are too precious to be given to her. I think so, too, but one cannot be rude, you know. Come, my dear, sit down. Seating herself, center. Have you brought your work? The devil! What can she mean? Pushing himself between Minette and the sofa. Donna Olivia, I am sorry to inform you that my physician has just been sent for to your father, Don Cesar. The poor gentleman was seized with a vertigo. Vertigos? To Minette. Oh, he has them frequently, you know. Yes, and they always keep me from his sight. Did ever one woman prevent another from leaving her at such a moment before? I really, madam, cannot comprehend. Caesar without. It is impossible, impossible, gentlemen. Don Julio cannot be here. Ha! Huh. Who is that? Enter Don Caesar, Don Garcia, and Don Vincentio. Left door. There. Did we not tell you so? We saw him enter the garden. What is the meaning of all this? A man in my daughter's apartment? Attempting to draw. Hold, sir. Don Julio is one of the first rank in Spain. 
and will unquestionably be able to satisfy your honor without troubling your sword apart we have done mischief vincentio julio to olivia they have been cursedly impertinent but i'll bring you off never fear by pretending a passion for your busy friend there satisfy me then in a moment speak one of you crosses to julio i came here sir by the merest accident the garden door was open curiosity led me to this apartment you came in a moment after and very civilly locked me in with your daughter locked you in why then did you not like a man of honour cry out the lady cried out sir and you told her you would not return but when donna olivia de zuniga entered for whom i have conceived a most violent passion a passion for her oh let me hear no more aunt a passion for her you may as well entertain a passion for the untamable hyena there vincentio what think you now zantippa or not i am afraid i must give up that but pray support me as to this point don caesar is not the lady fond of a jew's harp fond she's fond of nothing but playing the vixen there is not such a fury upon earth these are odd liberties with a person who does not belong to him i'll play the hypocrite for her no more the world shall know her true character they shall know but ask her maid there her maid why yes sir to say truth i am but dona olivia's maid after all olivia apart dear minette speak for me or i am now ruined i will ma'am going up to julio i must confess sir <clears throat> there never was so bitter a tempered creature as my lady is i have borne her humours for two years i have seen her by night and by day olivia pulls her sleeve impatiently to olivia i will i will and this i am sure that if you marry her you'll rue the day every hour the first month and hang yourself the next there madam i have done it roundly now exit right olivia aside I am undone. I am caught in my own snare. After this true character of my daughter, I suppose, Signor, we shall hear no more of your passion. So let us go down and leave Madame to begin her penance. My ideas are totally confused. You, Donna Olivia de Zuniga, and the person I thought you, her maid something too flattering darts across my mind if you have taken a fancy to her maid i have nothing farther to say but as to that violent creature oh do not profane her where is that spirit which you tell me of is it that which speaks in modest conscious blushes on her cheeks is it that which bends her lovely eyes to earth I she's only bending them to earth considering how to afflict me with some new obstinacy she'll break out like a tigress in a moment it cannot be are you charming woman such a creature yes to all mankind but one looking down but one oh might that accepted one be me would you not fear to trust your fate with her you have cause to think so hateful? No, I'd bless the hour that bound my fate to hers. Permit me, sir, to pay my vows to this fair vixen. What? Are you such a bold man as that? Oh, but if you are, twill be only lost time. She'll contrive some way or other 
to return your vows upon your hands. If they have your authority, sir, I will return them, only with my own. What's that? What did she say? My head is giddy with surprise. And mine with rapture. Touching her hand. Don't make a fool of me, Olivia. Wilt marry him? When you command me, sir. My dear Don Julio, thou art my guardian angel. Shall I have a son-in-law at last? Garcia, Vincentio, could you have thought it? No, sir, if we had... We should have saved that lady much trouble. Tis pretty clear now why she was a vixen. Yes, yes, tis clear enough. And I beg your pardon, madam, for the share of trouble I gave you. But, pray, have the goodness to tell me sincerely, what do you think of a crash? I love music, Don Vincentio. I admire your skill. And whenever you'll give me a concert... I shall be obliged. You could not have pleased me so well if you had married me. And who Don Carlos and Victoria write? Ha! Huh, here comes Victoria and her Carlos. My friend, you are happy. Tis in your eyes. I need not ask the event. What? Is this Don Carlos, whom Victoria gave us for a cousin? Sir, you come in a happy... Be our. I do indeed, for I am most happy. My dear Carlos, what has new made thee thus since morning? A wife. Marry, Julio, marry. What? This advice from you? Yes, and when you have married an angel... When that angel has done for you such things as makes your gratitude almost equal to your love, you may then guess something of what I feel in calling this angel mine. Now, I trust on Julio, after all this, that if I should do you the honor of my hand, you'll treat me cruelly, be a very bad man that I, like my exemplary cousin... Hold, Olivia. It is not necessary that a husband should be faulty to make a wife's character exemplary. Should he be tenderly watchful of your happiness, your gratitude will give a thousand graces to your conduct, whilst the purity of your manners and the nice honour of your life will gain you the approbation of those whose praise is fame. Pretty and matronly, thank you, my dear. We have each struck a bold stroke today. Yours has been to reclaim a husband, mine to get one. But the most important is yet to be obtained, the approbation of our judges. That meed withheld, our labors have been vain, pointless my jests and doubly keen your pain. Might we their plaudits and their praise provoke, our bold should then be termed a happy stroke. End of Act 5 End of A Bold Stroke for a Husband by Hannah Cowley